please join me in welcoming the astonishing Gina Davis. I am here today because I share a very similar uh, passion and mission with the Women's Foundation to support, encourage, and advocate for women and girls to reach their full potential. About six years ago, I founded uh, my research institute on gender in media because I wanted the data on one very specific thing. How many female characters were there in entertainment media made specifically for kids? Uh, because when my daughter was about two years old, I started watching little kid stuff with her. And I was absolutely, you know, now I have this spidey sense about women's roles, and I was absolutely floored to see that with some exceptions in preschool television, that there should be far fewer female characters than male characters in what we're making for the youngest kids. So first I just, I decided to check with my friends if they noticed, for example, there was only one female character in the movie that had just come out and, and none of them had noticed until I pointed it out. Um, so now I decided, well, I'll bring it up with people in the industry. If I happen to have a meeting you know, with a studio executive, producer, whatever, I will um, ask if they've ever noticed how few characters, female characters there were in G-rated movies. And to a person, they would say, Oh, no, 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 that's been fixed. So it occurred to me as a mother that certainly in the 21st century, we should be showing kids, boys and girls, sharing the sandbox equally, right? So I realized I need the numbers because no one seems to be noticing how bereft of female presence these uh, entertainment media were. So this took my life in an entirely new direction as a data head. Um, research has become extremely significant in my life. My institute has commissioned the largest body of research ever done on uh, gender in film and television covering a 20 year span and the results were, were stunning. It was conducted at USC's Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism by Dr. Stacy Smith and the world view that we are reflecting for children is very unbalanced. In family film ratings, for every one female character, there are three male characters. And of the female characters that did exist, the majority were highly stereotyped, narrowly stereotyped, or hypersexualized. Get this, in, in G-rated uh, animated movies, the female characters wear the same amount of sexually revealing clothing as the female characters in R-rated movies. <laughs> Why there's any um, sexually revealing clothing in a G-rated movie is a, is a very good question. Um, and also in animated films, because you, know, you could draw them any way you want, often the female character's waist is so tiny that you have to wonder, could you fit a spinal column in there? <laughs> And the most, uh, one of the most common occupations for female characters in G-rated movies was uh, royalty, which is a nice gig if you can get it. <laughs> Our research also showed that uh, females are missing from critical occupational sectors. Uh, we recently completed a comprehensive study of the careers of female characters in popular film and TV, and found that in family films, 81% of the jobs were held by men. Uh, if you look at STEM jobs, 84% uh, were held by men. And there were no female leads or co-leads who had uh, a career in STEM. And looking specifically at uh, computer science and engineering, the ratio of males to females in that category was 15 to one. Um, our research also showed that uh, in, in, in G-rated films, not one female was depicted in the field of medical science, as a business leader, in the law profession, or in politics. There were characters who were, who were in those fields, but all of them were male. What message are we sending to boys and girls at a very vulnerable age if the female characters are one-dimensional, sidelined, 
hypersexualized, stereotyped, or simply not there at all. We are saying that women and girls are less valuable to society than men and boys. We're saying women and girls don't take up half the space in the world. And the message is sinking in. The repetitive viewing patterns of children ensure that they see these uh, negative images over and over and over again, and they get imprinted at a very vulnerable age. So the more hours of television a girl watches, the fewer options she thinks she has in life. And the more hours a boy watches, the more sexist his views become. So clearly, an extremely negative message is coming through. And by feeding our kids this, this imbalance from the very beginning of their exposure to uh, media, we are, in effect, training generation after generation not to notice gender imbalance. And this happened to all of us, by the way, all of us, no matter when you were born, uh, you saw exactly the same imbalance in entertainment media because the ratio of male to female characters has been the same since 1946, exactly the same. Um, the fact is, women are seriously underrepresented across nearly all sectors of society. Um, but for the most part, we don't notice. The, I, I'm uh, on the board of the White House Project, which is uh, a nonprofit in the States uh, that encourages more women to get into leadership positions in, in uh, politics and business. And a couple of years ago, we did uh, a, uh, what we called um, a benchmark report where we looked at 10 sectors of society to find out the percentage of women in positions of authority. And uh, it was like uh, business, law, politics, media, uh, et cetera. And uh, so across the board, these 10 most important sectors of society, the average percentage of women was 17%. That percentage is actually all around us, if you look. Um, in the United States, 17% uh, of the Senate seats are held by women. The House of Representatives is 16.8% women. Only 17% of movie narrators are women, and women represent 16.1% of the boards of Fortune 500 companies. Women make up 17% of cardiac surgeons. So why would the percentage of women in leadership positions stall out across the board at about 17%. So here's another figure that might help shed some light on that. In films, uh, the percentage of female characters in crowd scenes and group scenes is 17%. 17% of crowd scenes? It's, I mean, you would have to go out of your way to leave out that many women, I would think. But, but I do have a theory about why that happens. I, I think Hollywood writers think that women don't gather. Um, <laughs> I mean, let, let's say it, it's a movie and there's a scene in a, in a village and uh, oh my God, something's going on over there, let's all go and see. And, and the women say, mm, I'm not the, <laughs> I'm not really interested in gathering. I have other, <laughs> other stuff to do. Um, So what if we are enculturating our kids to see groups with 17% women as the norm, right? Could it be that the percentage of women in leadership is, uh, in any given field, often stagnates at about uh, five to one because we've been trained to see that ratio as completely normal? By the way, um, this happened to all of us. We were all raised on TV and movies that had very few female characters and, and uh, very few that, we, that were role models or women that we wanted to grow up to be like. My, my best friend and I, every day after school, would play at being um, characters in western, westerns, cowboys. Um, and since I was taller, I would usually be the father and uh, <laughs> she would be my son. Um, <laughs> And because we were young, there weren't any female 
uh, we didn't realize that it's strange that we're not emulating female characters, but there weren't any that we wanted to pretend to be. You know, there were female characters. There were a couple of TV shows with the, where the lead character were, uh, was female. For example, uh, I Dream of Jeannie and, uh, and Bewitched, right? And, and those characters had, you know, incredible cool powers, but, um, but somehow, you know, we never wanted to pretend to be them. And if you think about it now, in hindsight, every episode seemed to be about them, uh, about them, their men wanting them to sit on their special abilities, not to use them, right? This happened in uh, several of my marriages. <laughs> <clears throat> The invisibility and disempowerment of women cry out for change. So, what can we do? Well, we know what the Canadian Women's Foundation is doing. Through their work, women and girls are being empowered to live without limits. The time for change is now, and I would like to introduce to you some very powerful agents of change who are in this room right now. All of you. All of us are powerful agents of change. Along with the Women's Foundation, we can embrace what Dr. Martin Luther King called the fierce urgency of now. What we need across all the sectors of society is to add women. We need more women on screen and behind the cameras in the realms of academia, business, law, the military, add women to the ranks of corporate boards, uh, policymakers, presidents, and prime ministers, add women, encourage women, include women, vote for women, hire women. Well, I'm just so happy to be here with all of you today to celebrate the Canadian Women's Foundation's leadership in empowering women and girls. Because I want the day to come soon when I can tell my daughter this story. You know, once upon a time, women and girls were thought to be less important than men and boys. And she will turn to me with an incredulous look and then say, Mom, are you making this up? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>